I want you to imagine with me that you are on a trip visiting some dear friends. You spend some time together, you reminisce about old times, memories that you've created along the way, and the time comes where you're preparing to leave, but you have to let them know some very important news, which is that you've been diagnosed with a terminal illness, and, and you don't have long, months at most, to live. Obviously, your friends would be shattered to receive the news. It would be a time of tears and sorrow and sadness. Uh, but it would be an opportunity for you to s express whatever is in your heart to share with your loved ones before you leave, seeing them for the very last time. What would you want to say to your friends? What would you want to say to those close to you that you know, this is the last time I'll see you? on this earth. It, thanks. Um, all sorts of things, expressing your love for them. Um, probably, you would also want to let them know, hey, Jesus is in my life. I plan on being in the kingdom. I want you to be there too. Um, so today, as we, as we go back into the book of Acts, we find a very similar situation that the Apostle Paul finds himself in. He has an opportunity on his trip back, his third missionary journey, he's heading back to Jerusalem, he's in a hurry to get there, but he stops off and spends some time with the elders of the church of Ephesus, and he has some final words for them, because he too recognized that he didn't apparently have long on this earth. So our sermon title today is The Last Word. Um, and actually, we'll be transitioning out of our series through the book of Acts uh, into something new next week. Um, I hope to come back and finish the rest of Acts, but we've really seen a lot of inspiring stories that have uh, been a challenge and a blessing to me, and I hope to you as well. So this will be our last time in Acts for a while. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, and we're going to... I, by 13, <laughs> Acts chapter 20, there's that sleep deprivation thing. Acts chapter 20, verse 13, is where we will begin this morning. Acts 20, verse 13. The Bible there says, Then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. When he met there, us there at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there the next day and came opposite Chios. The day following, we arrived at Samos and stayed there at Trogilium. The next day, we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, we're going to put a, a map up on the screen. I like visuals, and so I want you to see where we're talking about this morning. This is uh, what would be modern-day Turkey. Uh, so uh, we'll get that up in just a moment. Uh, Paul is sailing south. The, the ships in those days didn't tend to cut across big seas. They tended to follow the coastline. And so the places that are mentioned are either towns or islands, that he is passing by on his way. Um, interestingly enough, he stayed a little bit longer and decided to walk to the first town that's mentioned. That walk is about 30 miles. Um, perhaps he just wanted to spend a little bit more time with the brothers there in the city. Uh, the story of Eutychus had just happened. He had just been resurrected hours before this. And so perhaps uh, he's wanting to stay a little bit longer and make sure that Eutychus was okay and that he remained alive. We don't know the reason why he did this, but 30 miles is not a short walk. Would you agree? But Paul, we only have record of him traveling by foot or by ship. Uh, he may have been able to hop onto a cart from time to time, but in all his travels, thousands of miles, it was either by ship or by foot that we have record of. So starting there at the green circle, and the red line that's on the left, starting at Assos, they pass the Isle of Lesbos, through, uh, pass by Chios, 
uh, kind of following the coastline there. Eventually, we get to the blue circle there, Miletus, which is about 35 miles from Ephesus. He didn't want to take the time for himself to travel into the city, and naturally when he got to the city, there'd be a lot of people he would want to see, and it would take way too long. So he just sent word, which probably itself took a day, and then a day more for the brethren, the elders, the leaders of Ephesus, to come to him there at the port. Uh, and then they spent time together. So he, they probably had about three days there. We don't know if, if the ship was unloading, um, and they just had that space of time, or perhaps Paul had chartered this boat himself. In any case, he was on the way to Pentecost, but he wanted to talk to the leaders of the people that he'd been raising up this church for three years. And we find the only pastoral address or speech um, message from Paul in the book of Acts. Uh, it's very similar, you'll find, to the pastoral letters that Paul sent to Ephesus or Philippi. Uh, but in Acts, it's mostly evangelistic sermons, but here we find just a real beautiful message from Paul to the people he'd come to know and love so well. Look at verse 17. The Bible says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the very first day I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. And then he's going to describe how it was that he lived and worked among them. Now sometimes we in our modern culture might misunderstand what comes next as Paul being arrogant or boastful. Hey, look at me. This is how I lived. But that's not at all what the Apostle Paul had in mind. I think there are two main reasons why Paul had to spend time defending his ministry and by pointing out how he ministered. Uh, first reason is he was attacked a lot by enemies, physically and verbally and in all manner of attacks. And when Paul, as this evangelist, is bearing a message and people are attacking him, the message itself also gets attacked. And Paul didn't care so much about his reputation, but he cared the world about Jesus' reputation. He wanted Jesus and the gospel that he was presenting to look good and not be held in disregard. So he needed to make sure that the attacks on himself were shown to be unfounded so that the message that he was presenting would be shown to be true and trustworthy. And second of all, he's talking to the leaders. These leaders have never really done this before. And a lot of us learn best through example, through being shown uh, how something is done. And especially in the ancient world, discipleship was how so much was taught and learned. And so Paul is reminding them of his ministry example because he's not going to pass this way any longer. We'll see that in the next verses. But Paul knows these guys, they need to know how to lead. So just remember what I did. Did you ever take shop when you were in high school, like woodworking or welding? They don't offer it so much anymore these days, but raise your hand if you got to take something like that. And of course, home ec, those sorts of things. When we learned how to use the table saw, it was not simply by reading a few paragraphs in a textbook and then, well, I guess I know what to do. Let me fire this thing up. Not at all, <laughs> right? People lose their fingers to table saws. We learned through careful observation and instruction and example. We were shown how to be careful, how to use the machine properly, guided as we did it ourselves. Uh, as we used those sewing machines in home ec class, which was a scary thing all in its own, this needle jabbing up and down. Uh, keep your fingers away from that. It wasn't just something that we were taught verbally. We were shown how to use the machines. And so Paul is raising up these leaders and he's teaching them to the very last and reminding them how to live and conduct ministry. So look at what he says there. You know how I lived among you. Verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility. He's not boasting about his humility. He's reminding them, if you're going to be a leader, be a humble one. 
with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. You're going to go through difficulties if you're a leader. You will have tears and trials as a leader. Verse 20, how I kept back nothing that was helpful. He wasn't serving them out of selfishness, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks. He wasn't uh, using prejudice in his ministry. He was ministering to everybody. And he taught them repentance towards God and the faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. See now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. He was so committed to following God's will that it was like he was bound up. But it was the Holy Spirit leading him to Jerusalem. But notice what he says next. He says, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that, verse 23, the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. In other words, there were people, apparently, who had received messages from God to Paul, saying, Paul, you're headed to Jerusalem. It's it's nothing but trouble. Uh, Arresting, chains, difficulties. Uh, Perhaps Paul was receiving messages directly from the Holy Spirit. Uh, And and those types of messages might make someone want to avoid going to Jerusalem. That's the case. I'm going to go somewhere else. But notice what he says in verse 24. But none of those things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with what? With joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. There was something far bigger than even Paul's mortal existence. It was doing God's work that mattered most. So he said, hey, whether I live or die, doing God's will is what matters the most. We can learn a lot from that totally sold out and committed attitude. If I look in the mirror and be honest with myself, a lot of times it's more like, well, God, if if your will coincides with what I want to do, then I will go. And we pat ourselves on the back. That's not what Paul said. He said, God's will is the most important. And think about it for a moment. It it actually makes sense. If the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe has a plan for your life, do you think the, the plan of the maker of the mountains and the world and the galaxies, do you think his plan overall It's going to be a better plan than the ones we cook up in our little brains. I mean, the images that we get from the latest and greatest telescopes, uh, the the latest one, uh, it's just astounding. We're learning the universe is even bigger than we thought, which means that, that God is even more powerful than we thought. Not that he was ever limited in power. And so if he's the one guiding your life, do you suppose He's got a better plan than you and I do. And even if the plan doesn't seem like your first choice, do you suppose he has the power to make it, in retrospect, be the best plan? Yeah. God knows what's best. We had to have uh, Emmeline have a little procedure to loosen up her upper lip. It was holding her back. Uh, And that was not fun as a parent, having to watch her. It was very brief, and they, you know, numbed her really good, and the dentist did a really good job. Uh, But she did not enjoy that moment, right? We're hoping that she will have forgotten it uh, totally. Uh, And it's really helped out a lot. Uh, Really, it was exactly the right plan. But sometimes in the moment, God's plan for us feels like the exact opposite for what we want. Why do you hate me, God? You know, we think that sometimes, maybe not overtly, but we feel that. But we don't see 
in that moment, the heart of love that is guiding everything if we are submitting to his will. That ultimately, someday we'll look back and we'll talk with her when she's older and say, do you remember this? And she'll say, no. Well, this is what we did. And it helped show all your teeth when you smiled and be able to pronounce those sounds that you couldn't say before. Uh, and she'll recognize that we did it for her own good. Paul was sold out to this concept. He knew that God was a God of love and he wouldn't lead him any other way than what he would choose looking back. And so whether I live or die, I want to finish the race with joy. I want to be faithful to God. Verse 25, and indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. We're going to be talking about the kingdom coming up. The kingdom of God, you will see my face no more. He knew because of what the Holy Spirit had revealed to him, this is the last time you'll see me. Therefore, verse 26, I testify to you that this day I am innocent of the blood of all men. Referring back to Ezekiel's vision of the shepherds that were neglecting the sheep and therefore guilty of the blood of the lambs that they were neglecting. Paul saying, I had a duty and I discharged it faithfully. I have done all that I could do. Would that we could say that about ourselves also. Verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. Now some really important instructions. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Every soul is worth an infinite value to God. It took the blood of Jesus to save each and every one of us. We have a big responsibility. Not only does the pastor and the elders and the deacons and the deaconesses, but we as church body to look after one another as the people that Jesus has redeemed. And then looking into the future, he says this in verse 29, for I know this, after my departure, what will come in? Savage wolves will come in from where? In among you, not sparing the flock. And also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw disciples away after themselves. He predicted there were dangers on the horizon, but it wasn't this external atheistic enemy that, that they were going to be dealing with at that time. It was people in the church that we're going to be leading people astray. Brothers and sisters, we have to be careful in our culture from dangers all over the place, but we have to watch out even when we come to church. Uh, and if we offend one another, we need to apologize. And also, we need to extend grace to others when we offend each other. Uh, I offend people without even knowing it sometimes. <laughs> I called to apologize to someone. I said, I must have done something. I'm so sorry. Didn't know what I'd done. But we need to stick together while we encourage each other and while we guard each other against going astray with false teachings or people who, who don't have the best intentions for ourselves. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone day and night with tears. Paul was so earnest in his appeals. He loved the people so much. Sometimes people want to rebuke and warn, but they don't have the heart of love that gives them the tears when they do it. If you're going to share something strong with someone, you better have strong love, a love that's even stronger, and they better feel that love in order to receive what you're sharing with them. So now, verse 32, Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God can build us up. Amen? We can be entrusted to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build us up and make us more like him. Verse 33, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. 
Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities, for those who were with me. He was with them, making tents on the side, and he was preaching on the other times. I have shown you this in every way by laboring like this, and you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Would that all leaders in all churches received these words, that it wasn't about receiving, it was about giving instead. And when he had said these things, verse 36 says, he knelt down, and what did he do with them all? He prayed. And then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would not see his face anymore. And they accompanied him to the ship. These beloved brothers, um, perhaps sisters, they loved Paul so much that they wept and they kissed him. This was an, an Eastern greeting. In certain parts of the world, that's natural. Here in America, we, we don't kiss as much in greetings. Um, but they loved this man because he had poured out his heart and soul to them. He had showed them the way of life, and now he was leaving them uh, for the last time. That's all they heard uh, from Paul in person. But someday, when the Apostle Paul gets to heaven, I imagine he's going to be looking for a whole bunch of people, don't you think? When he gets to heaven, he'll be looking for these leaders that he shared that tearful goodbye with, and he wants to come up to them. He's going to go up to them and say, how did it go in Ephesus after I left? How did it go? What happened? Tell me about it. And then they'll say, well, hey, here's somebody that we won to the Lord. And here's another person. And after all that's done with all the cities and places and villages that Paul went to, and it'll be a long time, I want to go meet him myself. Haven't you enjoyed getting to see more of the heart of this dear man of faith? Do you want to meet the Apostle Paul also? I want to talk to him and I have some questions for him about some of the ways he wrote his letters. I want to hear more details of the stories that are recorded about him. But you know what? Knowing the kind of guy he was, he's going to get tired of talking about himself. He's going to want to know, well, enough about me. What? What about you? You got to live in the, in the last days of Earth's history. How did it go for you? And what did you do? What did Jesus do through you to reach other people? And he's going to be excited to hear the stories from you and from me. What do you want to share on that day? Well, Paul, you, you see... There was just this really interesting programming on, on this thing called a television, and I really wanted to get out there and witness for God, but you don't understand how interesting this was. I, you know, I was planning, the, but I just I wasn't able to. You see, Paul, I, just, I, was, I was so busy with all the things around my house that I, I was going to go meet my neighbors one of these days. But I, I don't want that to be my story. How about you? I want to be able to say, I did what I could. Jesus worked in me. Yeah, I was scared. Yeah, it was difficult. Yeah, there, there were some people who said, no, thank you. I'm not interested. I won't be able to say, probably, I got stoned, and then uh, they left me for dead, but I was, I was still alive, beaten with rods. All, you know, Paul, he'll, he'll have a new body. He won't have those scars, but if he, if he did, what do you want your story to be? I want my story to be, I opened up my heart to Jesus, and day by day, I did what I could. In big or small ways, I followed the will of God for me that day. 
and he used me to bless others. Do you want that to be your story too? Everybody can do something. You know, we're, we're getting into nominating committee season here soon. Uh, doing something doesn't mean that you have to have an office in the church. Amen? There is more ministry than just what happens in here. Amen? You don't have to be sent out by Parkwood Church to do ministry in your neighborhood. You are all appointed as the pastors of your neighborhood. You are the missionary in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your school. You are there for a reason. God has you there and wants to use you in big or small ways if you're willing. The same Holy Spirit that worked and raised up churches through Paul wants to work in my life and your life too. Today and this week, I want to say yes. Yes. Looking back from heaven someday, we'll look back and we'll say, God, your plan really was the best plan. I didn't want to at the time, but God, I'm glad I said Yes. So let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you know better than us. And you want to guide us. And you want to use us in big ways and small ways and in between ways. Upfront ways and behind the scene ways. You want to use us in all sorts of ways. And God, this morning, in our hearts, we say, I'm willing. Or help me, Lord, to be willing. I'm scared, Lord, but I'm willing. Please use me. We're saying honestly in our hearts the reflection of what our heart says. So use us, we pray. And may that day of reunions come soon when you gather us all up and take us home to heaven. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen and amen. God bless you. Enjoy sticking around for another fellowship meal, and we will look forward to seeing you very, very soon. God bless.